Welcome back to the GP Productions podcast. Welcome back to the show, and today I've got a special guest on the show. He's here to talk about this baby here, the history of metal and horror. Director, Mr. Mike Schiff, how are you doing, man? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Good to meet you. Thanks thanks for coming on. I know we kind of organized this a long time ago, but that's kind of the way I do things. I, I like to plan out these things like in advance rather than say, hey, do you want to do a podcast? And when do you want to do it? Yeah, let's do it tomorrow. You know, so I'm kind of like, uh, sometimes people don't like it. Um, I was talking to this kind of, big enough wrestler and um he said yeah man i'll do it and this was around christmas time and he's like when do you want to go and i said uh how about the 26th of february and he just didn't write back <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's, it's no yeah. problem for me so yeah, yeah yeah here we are um before we talk about the documentary film and everything about it just want to know a little bit about yourself and how did you get into filmmaking and were you into it from a younger age yeah, I mean, um, very early on, you know, I uh, I wanted to write these little sketches for, you know, for my cousins and I to perform together in front of our parents, you know, and we we're just little kids doing that stuff. But, you know, very early on, I've wanted to kind of direct and create scenes and things like that. And then later on, uh, I got into when I got into junior high, I uh, started doing some animation work and then, you know, in, in art class and then high school started studying films, took some uh, horror film history classes and um, some filmmaking classes. So I started very early on. And I also, my original goal was to be a special effects makeup artist. So I was doing a lot of that in junior high and high school. And then college, yeah, I just majored in film and video. After college, just started working freelance and um, just kind of moved on from there. And I've been in it ever since. What kind of other projects have you worked on before we get into the big one at the moment? Like, what kind of stuff were you doing up until this? Uh, a lot of a lot of freelance stuff. I mean, some things that pay the bills, you know, corporate yeah. corporate videos, um, some fun stuff, music videos. I did uh, uh, two music videos for John Carpenter. Um, I was uh, one of the camera guys for that. I also edited both videos. Um, I filmed and edited a video for Chris Jericho's band Fozzy yep. some years back. Uh, that's how I initially met him and got him to be the first interview in the documentary. And uh, a lot of other stuff, too. I worked at the Howard Stern Show for about eight years. And, um, yeah, I just kind of bounced around a lot. Did some short films and feature film work. And so this was uh, this, is, this is probably the biggest project that I've worked on in a while, you know, just yeah. because I, I ended up doing pretty much everything myself, you know, for the most yeah. part. So, yeah. In terms of this project, um, are these two loves of yours, metal and horror? And is that how it came about? Or how did you decide to, to make this thing? Yeah, I mean, I've been a horror fan since I was a kid. You know, my dad got me into it very early on. He was a horror fan when he was a kid, of course, back at, you know, when he was growing up, it was, it was all the universal horror films. And yeah. uh, then later he got into uh, Hammer House of Horrors, you know, those were some of his favorites. And then he kind of introduced me to a lot of stuff when I was a kid. So I was into horror very early on. Um, metal, not as much. At first, I wasn't really into music, you know, for, for the most part. Um, that was kind of a slow, slow way in. But I'd say probably in the um, maybe early, mid 90s, I started getting into it. And then I, you know, really you know metal became my my main genre of music after a while so basically how this project came about uh my friend robert lucas who is also a uh, producer uh on the film he's very well connected in the uh sort of the horror industry so specifically and yeah. he uh he's friends with kirk hammett from metallica so kirk was putting on his uh, fear festival convention out in california back in 2014 
and brought brought me on board to do some uh, do some camera work for the event, and um, you know just kind of hang out, you know, and, ha and have a good time. So basically, what Kirk did was he brought in his two favorite things, heavy metal and horror, and made a convention out of them. So it was just wall to wall horror, heavy metal, and everything. So afterwards, I you know turned to Rob. I said, "Hey, you know, has there ever been a documentary made on why these two genres work so well together? You know, why do they go hand in hand?" So there really hadn't been one um, at that point. So I started putting some ideas together and we had a lot of, between between the two of us, we had a lot of connections in both industries. So we were able to reach out directly or indirectly to a lot of the artists and ask them if they wanted to be part of this documentary. So um, yeah, Chris Jericho was the first one because I already knew him. Um, and Rob, you know, had a bunch of friends in the business, a bunch of the horror guys, especially. And we just started kind of meeting people also at horror conventions. Sometimes we just go up to people there. Yeah. Uh, ask them to, uh, be a part of it. And, um, yeah, next thing you know, we are over almost 70 interviews, uh, in the film. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you mentioned like Kirk Hammond been like doing that convention because that's something I didn't know about until I researched and watched some of your previous interviews. But that convention world now in America is it's absolutely huge over there. So when did when did he do that convention? And is he like a part of, I suppose, how this thing exploded in the States? Yeah, I mean, the, the his first convention, he did two of them. One was in 2014. Uh, I think the next was in 2015. So he Kirk had been a fan of horror since he was a kid. You know, he talks yeah. about it in, in the film. Um, but he has a book also called Too Much Horror Business, which um, which is actually kind of hard to get now. And if you do find it, it's it's pretty pretty expensive because um, I think there were a limited amount of copies released. But it it really is his life story uh, regarding horror. So there are a lot of photos of him, you know, as as, uh, as a young kid, you know, with with all of his horror co collections, and he's just been collecting stuff ever since. So basically, at the conventions, he brought a lot of his own personal stuff his, his original posters um you know uh statues props all this type of stuff that he kind of collects you know that he's been collecting for a long time and and he put all this stuff on display very much like a uh, almost like a museum exhibit so um yeah kirk is definitely one of those one of those guys who makes it known you know that that he's a huge horror fan and if you look at his guitars when he's performing on stage he'll have all of his, his guitars are basically uh, designed with, um, you know, with horror uh, stuff on it. You know, he might have the mummy on there or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, he's, uh, he's he's definitely not shy about it. That's for sure. Yeah. And in terms of the process of getting this movie made, um, what way did you decide that you wanted to get it done? And did you have a list of people say in your head that I need to get this person on, I need to get this person on, or what way did it work for you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I started putting the ideas together, I, I started thinking about who would be, you know, good to have on camera to represent the story. Yeah. Um, so I, I knew that as far as, you know, I wanted to have both people from the metal world and people from the horror world. So, um, you know, like on the metal side, I was thinking first and foremost, you know, what is their horror connection? You know, like how, how do how do we know that they're actual horror fans? And, and so we were able to start kind of going through a lot of bands, you know, like I knew for a fact that Corey Taylor from Slipknot is a huge horror fan, you know? Yeah. Um, I know that um, Rob Zombie, of course, is, is yeah. you know, someone major uh, in both both worlds. Uh, and then, then a lot of the uh, the horror people too, you know, um, they maybe weren't necessarily horror, like heavy metal fans, but I wanted to have them on board just to sort of, you know, share their, stories and then talk about their careers and what you know maybe like doug bradley who played uh, pinhead in hellraiser you know yeah he's not a horror fan but it was great to have him talk about what his character pinhead brought to the horror industry um but also because he worked with with uh, guys like danny filth you know from cradle of filth yeah on on a bunch of their albums i mean there's obviously a, a, a connection there between the two so those were just angles that I was looking at all the way through like what is you know what is you know this person's interest in in the genre and how can they help tell this the story so um yeah that's basically how I kind of envisioned it yeah was there anyone that you really wanted to have on this project but you couldn't get a hold of for whatever reason yeah, you didn't have, <laughs> yeah. or do you want yeah. to talk about that uh I, I won't get into specifics um yeah 
But what, what I usually tell people is if, if there's someone who you think should be in the film and isn't, chances are I try to get them and it didn't work out <laughs> yeah, for yeah. whatever reason. And I think there are a few obvious, uh, uh, you know, um, artists who, who should be in it, but it just didn't, didn't happen. You know, yeah. not, not from lack of trying, but, yeah. um, but there's, it's, you know. it's a huge cast though at the same time. Like it's something you should definitely be proud of. Yeah. No, I got, I got very lucky. Um, sorry, my cat's just trying to get my light. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, she's a little mischievous. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> what I was gonna, I was gonna say was, um, you have someone would say like Corey Taylor, and mm -hmm. you you talk about like when you were growing up watching these horror movies and stuff. But then even into the late '90s and early 2000s, you had like Slipknot were really getting big, mm -hmm. and they were. I know this is not a total horror movie, but then they had uh, like My Plague, the song for Resident Evil and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I think like the connection has always been been there. Like, but not a lot of people know it's there unless I think you're a fan of both. Do you find that? Yeah, I, th I think if you're not really paying attention to it, it, it just kind of goes over your head. You know, yeah. but if you but if you're into both, yeah, then it's like, oh yeah, I hit the the soundtrack to uh, you know Nightmare on Elm Street three has has Dokken and uh, you know and other bands on there and um queen of the dam soundtrack and, and things like that so yeah it's like mm. if you're if you're really into it you're gonna notice these things yeah and some and people it, might say oh yeah you know like the, yeah it's kind of obvious or whatever but it uh again it just kind of goes over a lot of people's heads they're not really thinking about it too much yeah one one director that stands to mind for me is ronnie Yu when he done bright of chucky and freddie versus jason there was mm -hmm. they brought out like compilation cds especially for those um films as well and there was a lot of rock bands in them like kill switch engage and who else I, there was just so many i think drowning pool may have been in one as well Slipknot, mm -hmm. i think we're on it so it's something that i've always noticed anyway from my side of things yeah yeah, yeah. well i mean these music these films are aggressive and the music's aggressive so uh so the soundtracks just kind of make sense yeah in terms i want to ask you because like I, i'm obviously a wrestling fan as well about the the video that you've done for fuzzy the sandpaper video mm -hmm. Was that an idea that came directly from you, or did they have any input into it, or did, did you just have free reign with that? Uh, they they wanted to do a uh, a music video with an Evil Dead theme to it, so yeah. they wanted to. So the idea was that the band was in this cabin, very similar to what's in Evil Dead, and then they all get possessed by demons, and um, and then so we we kind of recreated a few scenes uh, from Evil Dead. Uh, and put them into the into the sandpaper video. So, um, so my friend uh, Sean McEwen, who I'd worked with in the past, um, he reached out to me and said, "Hey, got this band Fozzy who's looking to do a music video. Uh, would you want to come on board to to shoot it and edit and maybe co-direct and, and stuff?" And I said, "Sure." So we uh, we flew down south and work went to, down to this this old cabin and just kind of uh, we we pretty much had everything. Uh, written out as far as what uh, you know, what we were capable. Basically, we had to work around what we were capable of of, um, of working with um, and stuff. So, so we had a cabin, we had the woods, and uh, we had some old bridges to work with, cemetery things like that. And uh, so we we try to pick out a few scenes from from Evil Dead that would translate into the music video. So that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty much how that, uh, that all came about, but that's just another example of, of, a, a band that is horror influenced that wanted to bring that into, um, you know, into their music and music videos. Yeah. And that's something I also wanted to talk about because obviously I, I run wrestling nights. This is how I start. I started the promotion game running wrestling nights. So it's basically screenings in Dublin, Ireland, where, we go in, have a few beers, watch the wrestling, and because of the time difference, it's on till maybe five AM over here. So yeah. really good. You can imagine you can imagine how we are when we're leaving. But yeah, um sure. <laughs> but I noticed that a lot of the crowd that was coming to us were like rocker guys and guys with long hair, guys with tattoos, guys with Metallica t shirts, guys like um that were just you could tell that they were into rock. So what I started doing on top of the wrestling nights, I started running metal nights as mm -hmm. well so and then i've noticed that metal nights you'd see guys come in and they might be wearing like a friday the 13 t-shirt or they could be wearing like a jason t-shirt and when i started this podcast my three bases around it were 
horror, wrestling, and metal. Where do you think wrestling fits into this circle, or do you think it does fit in? Yeah, I, I think I think it does. I think there are a lot of um, uh, people who are into all three. Um, yeah. Again, you know, Chris Jericho, of course, being being sort of an obvious example. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I remember after I interviewed uh, George Fisher, you know, Corpse Grinder, from yeah. Cannibal Corpse. Um, he spent, uh, you know, maybe half an hour just talking about wrestling afterwards. You know, a huge wrestling fan. So I think a lot. I think a lot of these guys are. I think they they. Um, it's it's all. I think one thing that they all have in common is is that they they're aggressive, you know, and they're theatrical. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're sort of into that, those types of themes, you know, then wrestling can be attractive to uh, someone who's into metal or someone who's into horror, you know, and um, uh, so certainly a lot of the characters in, in wrestling have also brought on some horror as far as their um, their outfits and their masks and, and things like that. So, so there's definitely a crossover uh, between yeah. wrestling and them as well. When you look at the transition of those three things, like you'd say wrestling, horror, and rock music, which is your favorite now, if you were to pick one in its current climate? Because they've all changed, whether it be for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's tough. I mean, I, like for, I, for I, me personally, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I'm a huge wrestling fan. I, I said mm-hmm. to you there that I'm going to Dallas this year for WrestleMania, but when I watch the product now, I don't get that enjoyment out of it. It's not even, I don't think, because of my age. It's just because it's different. It's a different show. It's not yeah. character-based as much anymore, and it's all about in-ring competition, which is fine, but I still think you need that little more storytelling in there. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you look at the, the horror movie world, I, like I can't remember too many good horror films that I've seen in the last 10 years that weren't maybe remakes or reboots of something that mm-hmm. I enjoyed in the eighties or nineties. And what was the other thing? The other thing was like metal. Oh, the metal, the metal. Yeah. yeah. In the metal as well. Like, so I kind of grew up in like, I start listening to bands in like the, the late nineties, early two thousands. So like my bands were like, um, Slipknot, Limp Bizkit, Corn, those kind of bands, and mm-hmm. now I'm kind of struggling to find new music that I like. That's just that's it's my what, take on it. Yeah. Anyway. No, it's it's I, I agree with that. It's um, yeah. it's not I, I as far as the metal goes, I feel like there's not a lot that's really like new stuff that's really hitting you know from all different directions. Like, oh my god, that's awesome! That's fantastic! I love this. Let me pick this up. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of. For me, it's, it's it's every now and then something comes, you know, a band maybe that I'm already into comes out with a new album. I'll check it out. Maybe I'll be into it. Maybe I won't. Uh, but a lot of times I still listen to the old stuff. You know, old, yeah. Old, old music from the 80s, 90s, two th- early 2000s or whatever. So it's I keep some stuff in rotation and I'm always trying to find new stuff. So maybe there's a band that I'm kind of into. I've, I like a couple of their, so- their songs that, that I might say, oh, let me see what else they got in, in their catalog outside of the stuff that we hear on the radio or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll dive in, you know, jump on Spotify or whatever and, and start listening to a couple of things. And then maybe I'll start buying some stuff if I'm really into it. Yeah. Um, with, with horror, it's, you know, it's, it's peaks and valleys with, with horror. I mean, there've been a lot of great times, you know, the eighties were, were, it was a fantastic decade for horror, just as far as creating new characters and, and new stuff that's obviously replicated now. Uh, 90s was kind of a, a slow decade. I would say 90s was probably one of the worst decades for, for horror. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I think they they try to crank out just so much stuff, you know, so much content. And Too many, it, yeah. And I think they just started to insult the, the intelligence of the audience, whereas like you're watching something and it's just like, what, you know, like, what the hell is this? It's just so silly and stupid and poorly written and um, but it's just because they, they were they're all just about making money. You know, they just want to crank out a bunch of films and make a lot of money and they didn't really care about making art or anything really intelligent so it's just a lot of silly stuff in the 90s and then i think they started getting a little bit more respectful of the, audi- the audience so i will say that over the past you know 20 years or so there are definitely films that uh that i do enjoy you know i think like something like the ring was one of the early ones that kind of took horror again into a much darker more serious less silly 
uh, type, yeah. type of way. And I, I think a lot of other filmmakers learn from films like that uh, and started respecting the audience a bit more. So, yeah, I'd say over the last 20 years, definitely the horror is different, you know, especially from from the prior decades. But I think there's still some good stuff in there. I think there's some very well-written, well-directed films uh, that, that still kind of give us hope. I think it, it would be um, pretty depressing if, if there was just nothing good you know, coming out or if, or if there are just so few horror films. But I mean, even even some horror series, you know, on Netflix and things like that are, are, uh, are fantastic. Um, yeah, I was I was really impressed um, with the, the Chucky TV series that came out in Sci-Fi. Yeah. And I, I thought that franchise was dead because I'm a huge Chucky fan. Because sure. normally you might say a TV show, that's the end. But it actually, it was pretty good. They Well, that's the thing too. Like a lot, a lot of these series are, uh, are created by very... Uh, very clever, uh, talented people who, yep. uh, who again, really do respect the audience and, and kind of had learned what to do and what not to do. And, and I think for the most part, they're, they're getting it right with a lot of these series, you know, like, uh, um, what is it? The um, House on Haunted Hill, I think is, is uh, when that was out that not, not too long ago that I thought was really one of the creepiest series that I've, that I've ever seen um, and, uh, and things like that. So that, that stuff is great. Uh, as far as wrestling, I mean, I, I can't say that I'm really a huge wrestling fan, but certainly in the 80s, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I was watching all well, the, the early WrestleManias, you know, I mean, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, like those things were just like, it was hard to not pay attention, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, and not get into it and be and really feel something when you're when you're watching, you know, the buildup you know, kind of, kind of grow. And then all of a sudden here they are standing face to face and all that stuff. And that type of excitement back in those days was definitely, uh, definitely something. So it's hard for me to really comment that what, on what's going on these days, because I'm not really paying that that much attention to it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I hope there's still stuff out there for wrestling fans that, um, you know, that gets them excited. Yeah. We'll touch back on the movie again. And I just want to know how it's been received you're doing a lot of film festivals and how is it going for you on, the, going, on the circuits? Yeah, it's going good. I've been, I've been uh, doing the festival circuit since August, I think. And um, I, I think we're at uh, maybe 19 wins and, and another 11 nominations at this point. Wow. So yeah, it's been going well. And, and it's been, it's been shown all the way from, you know, here in New York, all the way to California, to uh, London, to South Africa, um, Denmark, I think, and and it's definitely uh, definitely getting around, and the reception's been good, you know, and it's it's um, I, I really can't complain. It's it's been it's been a great ride so far, and uh, hopefully within the next few months it'll start getting out to the public. Hopefully with streaming and and uh, physical discs and things like that. So yeah, it's uh, the process is a lot of fun too. Going to a lot of these, you know, the festivals have been you know not doing as well because of COVID. Yeah, that's so, what I was going to say. It's tricky because you you probably can't go to some of them and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the festivals I used to be in person are now online, which is not much yeah. fun. <laughs> no, you know that's not that's not really a festival. It's like you're putting something online for for people to to watch on their computers or whatever, and it's just uh, it's it sucks. But it is what it is, and and unfortunately. That's the best we can do in some in some circumstances. There are some festivals that have opened up in person, but they come and go. You know, some stay open, and then you get a new you know uh, variant of of COVID, and then they have to shut down again, and then they open and close. So I've been I've been able to attend a few, and uh, and the the horror conventions have been really good because some of them have um, film festivals built in. So we got a few coming up. I got the Days of the Dead Festival at the end of this month. I got um, Horror Hound Weekend coming up at the end of March. So it's uh, it's been good. So there's there's been enough in person stuff to um, you know to keep things fun. You know. Yeah, yeah, and hopefully you get a few more because it's definitely tricky times trying to promote a movie with everything that happened. Were you were you just about ready to go with this movie before COVID hit, or did you still have to tie up a few loose ends? <laughs> Well, I got I got lucky in a sense because everything was already filmed uh, before COVID hit, so it yeah. didn't COVID really didn't slow me down as far as the production goes, and everything was already in the can. Um, I had been editing all, all along the way, but really the, the only thing that was left to do was just uh, you know more post production stuff, just finish up the editing, get the, uh, the sound mix done, visual effects, 
all the legal work, things like that. So um, that's that's all stuff that didn't require being face to face with anybody. You know, yeah. all that stuff is outsourced to uh, to different people from who work from home anyway. So um, in that sense, I was I was very lucky because I think if I had started working on this film when COVID hit, it, it just wouldn't be where it is now. It, you know, it just wouldn't it wouldn't have happened. You know, no, I, you. I I don't know how many interviews I could have scored um, during that time. So um, yeah, so I, I did okay with that. If you, if it was during COVID, you probably would have had to do all these interviews like this. But I would imagine oh, you got yeah, all the yeah. you got all the interviews done in person, though, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything was in person. Uh, I filmed everything. Uh, a lot of them were. A bunch of them were shot uh, uh, at conventions, not on the convention floor. We always had a room that that we yeah. set up and, and everything. Um, some places were some shoots were at people's homes, things like that. So yeah, and I, and I just either people would be in town here in New York, and I go get them, or I'd fly out to wherever they were, um, and and do it that way. So you know, luck, when I was lucky, I was really able to fly out to maybe one place and just get a lot of interviews at the same time. But then there were certainly times when I had to you know fly out to one place and just get one interview. But it was an important interview, so it was well worth it. Mm -hmm. If you were to put like a time frame, and I don't want to put you under pressure about when you think that this will be out for the public approximately, when do you think that'll be? I'm I'm aiming for the next, maybe the as early as the next two months, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, and maybe maybe as later as as uh, three months. Um, I'm still I'm still open to distribution options. Yeah. Uh, at this point, I, I've i've been given a few a uh, few offers but i'm still holding out for something that i'm really happy with so yeah. and if and if that doesn't happen then i could also just sell it myself i mean it's so easy these days to open up your own online store and just have have uh, all the product you know in a storage or whatever like that and just ship it out myself it's more work but it's also kind of rewarding in a way because then i have full control over it um, and I don't have to worry about what a distribution company is doing because unfortunately a lot of them are pretty shady and, and yeah, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll take your film and then they'll throw it in the, in the back of their, uh, the rest of their you know catalog and just, they're not going to give it any special attention. It's just going to be another title. And, uh, but obviously if it, if it's a major company that can really push it and, and give me a good deal, then I'm open to it. So. We'll see, Finger, but but, but I, I, yeah, but I, I don't want to hold it up any longer. I know that there have pe been people who have been really waiting, people who have donated to to my fundraising campaigns early on um, that I really want to get the film to, to you know, before before everyone else as well. So yeah, if it doesn't uh, get picked up by distributor, then I'm just going to put it out myself within the yeah. next few months. And if people want to find out more information, have you got the website on hand there? Yeah, so it's metalhorror.com. So that's that's the main site, and then uh, certainly uh, for uh, Instagram, Facebook, things like that, it's at the Metal Horror. So they can uh, they can find the project on there and uh, keep up to date on uh, where the film's at and when it's going to be released and and all that stuff. Yeah, Mike, it was a pleasure to talk to you today, man. I look forward to seeing it. Hopefully, you ship to Ireland. Yeah, I haven't been out there yet. I'd love to. Yeah. I'd love to head out yeah. there and, and and check it out. So yeah, one of these days. Thanks a million, man. All right, thank you. Appreciate thank it. You.